Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we now come before you. We ask that you would teach us what you would have us to know from your scriptures. You've promised us that you will not leave us nor forsake us, and you've also promised us that you would teach us all things in the scriptures. You would teach us spirit of truth. You would teach us truth. And so now, Holy Spirit, would you pierce the darkness? Would you just uh, melt it away? And would you bring forth truth out of your word that would help us to live in such a way that Jesus is held up high and that people know who you are because of who we are? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I wonder, has God ever inconvenienced you? Has there ever been a time when you thought, you know what, God, that was not cool. That was not a great timing, right? Uh, has there ever been a moment where you're rushing around and, and you're trying to get somewhere and God doesn't have your calendar and you're like, what in the world? Didn't you get my email, God? That wasn't supposed to happen. I have things I've got to accomplish. Has that ever happened to you? Well, I want, in this story of the birth of Christ, I want to pinpoint a specific one. And by the way, if you'd like to join us for the story, we have books right over there for you that are free. We want you to have one. They are a gift to you. All right, there are two books that you can have to help you go through the story. One is the, book, the, the story itself. It's the, the narration of the story. It's not meant to replace the Bible, like I said before, but it's, helped, it's meant to help us go towards the Bible. And then there's another resource called, it's a small group resource, because we do have small groups that are going through each, each week, going through the material that we can't cover here. If you have one of those small group books, you'll notice that that's the passage that I preach from every week. So if you'd like to follow along in that, that's where I'm going to be uh, concentrating every week. And so this week in our small group book, you'll see the passage, Luke chapter 1, and I've extended it a little bit, Luke chapter 1 verses uh, 39 through 48. If you have a a sermon handout, you'll see the passage there. I'd love for you to read along with me. This is the portion of God's story uh, in Luke. Luke, who is a physician, by the way, you know, I can't wait to get to heaven to say to Dr. Luke, hey, tell me, what was it like when you interviewed Mary and she told you, yeah, I was a virgin and I was pregnant. Tell me as a doctor what you did. Like, you know, you had to be thinking, wait a minute, I'm a doc. Don't be telling me that. That's not true. Like, what happened? <laughs> I just can't wait to talk to Dr. Luke about that one day. So here's God's word in Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 48. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town of Ju- in Judah. Now, she's already been told that she's going to be with child, and she is already with child, and she is traveling to go be with Elizabeth. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Please note that the Bible makes no apology for calling it a baby, right? Notice this baby is probably six months old and it's all six months in her womb and it's already responding to the the proclamation of Mary, her voice, the baby inside is already. We here at Church of the Valley believe in children. We believe in life because the Bible teaches that and preaches that. Please be aware that our culture does not, and I am terribly sorry about that, but we believe that life is to be held up. And so we have a perfect example right here where a baby, not a fetus, responds to Mary's voice. And look what happens. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, just hello, just that, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she pro- exclaimed with a loud cry. This is, this is not just a, hey, you scared me to death, right? It's an intentional, listen to what I'm about to say. This is amazing, Right? Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. 
And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, can you believe this has happened to me? I mean, this is such an inconvenient time. I don't even know what to tell people. This is unbelievable. I had to leave the town and come out here with you in the country because I'm embarrassed. Is that what she said? (laughs) <laughs> what did she say? She said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, what is it? All generations will call me blessed. That's the beginning of the Magnificat. And you'll see as she continues to speak that that has become so much a part of our Christmas story. We sing it every year. But here we see God interrupting Mary's story. Would you agree? Let me, let me maybe paint the picture better for you. She's a teenager, right? She's betrothed to be married. She's not married. She's not even close yet. They're in the checking out phase. Will this thing work before we ever get married? They're not even supposed to be living together. And she's what? Pregnant. That may not be a big deal today, but in that day, when there was a total of a hundred people in your village and everybody knew everybody's stuff, right? It wasn't a big town. Bethlehem was not that big. And matter of fact, they were broken up into sections. And your little neighborhood, what we call neighborhoods now, consisted of about 60 people. Homes were connected to one another. Families shared rooms. And on top of that, they were poor, so it's even worse. Everybody knew everything. What would you do? Because do you remember why the angel came to Mary in the first place? First of all, it was God's plan, it was God's purpose. But he comes to Mary and says, you, O favored one. Well, was that because she was out at the bar the night before hanging out with all kinds of men? No. She was someone who was notable as a teenager. Someone who was pure. Someone who had an awesome reputation. And here God says, "Hmm, I don't care about any of that. This is my purpose and my plan. Out of all the people in the world could say, God, you kind of inconvenienced me. I think it would be Mary. Wouldn't you agree? (laughs) I don't want any part of this, man. Here's what I want you to know. Two truths about our part in God's plan. I just want you to grab this real quickly, okay? There are two ginormous truths here in this story about our part in God's plan. The first one is this, God calls people into his purpose. You don't call God into your purpose. God calls you into his purpose. God is the one who is king of kings and lord of lords. He is the one presiding all of all of his creation. Matter of fact, you are his creation. He owns you. Whether you're a believer or not, he owns you. Did you know that? He made you. He has a purpose for your life. He has a purpose and plan that he is working out, and you are a part of that. Did you know that? That there's not anybody who is made as a mistake. Whether you are a believer or not believer, either one, both of you have a purpose. One of you will be to glorify God, and the other one will be to glorify God. Both of you are the same one. You will glorify God either in your disbelief or in your belief. Either way, God will always get the glory. I know sometimes it feels like because we have a calendar and we have schedules, right, that we're going to say, hey, God, I got to get this done today, so can you just kind of help me out get my stuff done? And God obliges us because he's a good father on many occasions. But the truth is it, the truth is, is that God invites people into his purpose. Now, here's the issue. Some of you might be thinking, well, Joel, that was a long time ago, and Jesus has already come, and he's already died on the cross, and so now it's kind of just kind of all done. So we're just kind of waiting until he comes back. Is that what you believe? Is that what the Bible teaches? 
that you're just kind of on cruise control now because God is finished with his purpose and he's just kind of saying, well, let's see, it's not quite time yet. Like you're sitting at the microwave and you're waiting for the last 25 seconds of that Pop-Tart, you know, and you're going, well, let's see, it's almost done. Let me grab something to drink real quick. That is not at all what God is doing. God currently is still working at Genesis chapter 3. I've told you this over and over and over again. The Emelagon, the the first gospel is found in Genesis chapter 3, where it talks about how he will crush the head of Satan. How many of you know that Satan's head's not crushed quite yet, right? You experiencing that? Feeling the pressure of that? God's work is not done. The church's work is not done invading the gates of hell, right? You know what I'm talking about? When it, the scripture says the gates of hell will not prevail over the church, when, you ever watch Braveheart, right? Those famous scenes where they're fighting, you know, right? Or any Civil War movie, you know, where they, they come out and they sit there and I can't imagine being one of the first persons in the front row just like, I'm waiting to get shot, but here we go, you know? It's going to take me 20 seconds to get this thing loaded, I mean, I just couldn't imagine. Have you ever noticed any of them in any of these scenes carrying a gate? Well, I'm going to grab this gate because this is a really great weapon. The reason that passage says that is because we, the church, are supposed to be on offense. The purpose of the Lord is to crush the head of Satan. That means we as light in the darkness is to, supposed to shed light everywhere till there is no darkness. Does that make sense? Your attention, please. 83% of people. What? How many church, how many people know this? I've been saying this for how long? 83% of people in our area do not attend church. Have we, are we knocking on the gates of hell yet? Are we in God's purpose yet? Nowhere in Scripture are you given permission to join a church and sit in a chair and not hit the button on the back. You guys all know there's a button on the back of your chair. It ejects you out of it, right? You know, Be careful, because if you make the person behind you angry, they're going to hit that button. It's going to eject you out. It's going to be funny. Everybody's going to laugh. There is an eject button on the back of your seat that says, get involved. Do something. You're no longer allowed to be a consumer. It's time to get in the mission of God. And the mission of God has a grand purpose of making all things right. It's a very simple purpose. He's unraveling the curse of sin every day. And he is successful. The church is doing amazing things all over the world. And you have a grand invitation to be a part of it. Why? Because God calls people into his purpose. Now, number two is this, simply this. Because you might be saying, okay, Joel, how do I know what I'm supposed to do in his purpose? Number two, God confirms his calling through others. I believe the reason this story is bent the way it is is because Mary, as a teenager, needed to go to her older family member, to say, what in the world is going on? Mary can't even get in the door. All she says is a greeting to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says, let me tell you why you're here. Let me confirm the work of the Lord in you. I mean, is that pretty confirming to you? You have it, because she didn't text her ahead of time, hey, I'm coming over, you know? That didn't happen. She didn't send her an email saying, hey, just so you know, I'm traveling through, I'm coming out of Bethlehem right now, I'll be there in just a few minutes right? She didn't say any of that. Elizabeth didn't know she was coming. There was no telephone. She shows up, walks in the door, and says, hey, what's going on? And Elizabeth goes, blessed be the name of the Lord. My goodness, what God has done. You are favored among many. I mean, really? I think sometimes we blow over the story. We don't really get a hold of the fact that God sends people into our life to confirm what he's calling us to do. God sends people into your life to confirm the purpose that God is working out with you right now. And I'm so thankful for that. 
So in our denomination, I've served as grading ordination exams uh, for new candidates, new pastors wanting to come in. I've graded their exams. I've sat with them. I've uh, counseled them. I've tried to help them get in to ECO. ECO is our denomination, Covenant Order of Presbyterians. That's what we are. And, um, and there have been multiple times where I've had to say, mm, hey, let's, uh, let's think about this some more, right? <laughs> um, the Bible is authoritative, right? Or we have to have other conversations. And there are places where I had to say to them, hey, let's work this out. And we've built it, the system, so that we're actually working with people. It's not a yes or no. It may, it's a maybe. Let's talk more about it and see where you are. And then we get them the training that they need. Maybe it's seminary. Maybe it's not. Maybe they've already finished seminary and they need some other stuff. Why is that? Because we feel like it's important to have people in their lives to help them to determine the greatest call of their life. In my mind, and you might not feel this way, but in my mind, there is nothing greater that I could be doing right now. This, to me, is the most amazing thing that every week I get 15 minutes to preach to you, right? (laughs) You are going, what in the world? I think it's, a matter of fact, when I was coming into the ministry, I actually went and sat with an older minister and said, look, here's the deal. Why in the world do I want to stand up in front of people every week and talk? There's got to be something wrong with that. There is some, do I like attention? Is that what it is? There's something wrong with me. And the pastor said, of course there's something wrong with you. It's called sin. You're a sinful being. And your motives are never going to be pure. But the truth is, is God calls people into his story. And he's called you to be a pastor because there's no explanation for it. Why on earth would anybody want to do this? There is this burning in your bones, the Bible says, that you have to proclaim the goodness of the Lord or you're just going to explode. Some of you talk about my passion. I'm like, no, it's not passion. It's like, if I don't say it, I'm going to actually explode like the bird, you know, feathers everywhere. That's what's going to happen. Every week, God fills me to pour it out to you. And who confirmed that? People along my journey who said, Joel, you're not weird. We all deal with this. This is what it means to be a pastor. They were people who understood my plight. All right? So here's the deal. Not everyone will agree with you. Just like some rejected Mary's news about her calling, her mom, dad, everybody, pretty much, many will reject yours too. This is why we need other people in our life, specific people. There are times when uh, you're working at the purpose God has set you to do, and people are not in agreement with that, and they will attack that, literally. Why would they do that? There's a couple of reasons. They're just unaware. They have no idea what they're doing, right? Jesus on the cross says, forgive them, Father, for what? They don't know what they're doing. They have no idea. They don't have a view of your purpose, what's going on right now. Sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's the enemy sending them into your life to destroy and hijack what God is doing. So you've got to be discerning. Not everyone is going to agree with you. I had a, my, um, my nephew emailed me one time when I was in ministry, when he was thinking about coming into ministry. And uh, he wrote me this email, hey, Anka, I think God's calling me into ministry, right? And what do you do when people tell you that? You say, oh, that's wonderful, so excited for you. It's a celebration immediately. Like it's already confirmed, you're done, it's all you need to do, just announce it. That's not what we do. We, as clergy, say, is there anything else you can do? Because if there is, you don't need to do this. But this is my nephew, my fam, my, my blood. I'm not going to tell him this, so how do, I, how do I say it, right? So I say, uh, I wrote this long email. It took me like three days to write. I mean, it was just like this long. Turned into like a two-page document. I was like, okay, I can't do that. You know, he's not even going to read it. So I I sat on it, prayed about it, thought about it, and I emailed him one question. I said, can you do anything else? And you know what he said to me? He took a couple days, (laughs) 
And he said, hey, thanks, Unc. You're the only one that's really asked me, should I think about this? And I was like, look, man, it's not that pe- people are excited. They're, they want the best for you. It's not anything they mean. It's just we know how hard it is, and you need to make sure that there is nothing else you can do. This is not like a side hustle. This is not like driving an Uber just in case, you know, you don't make it quite. This is it, man, because you're going to take shots, and you need to be sure that this is what God has called you to do. You too, too. You need to make sure that what God has called you to do, purposed you to do, is yours. And so right now, I think there might be a question that you're dealing with, and that is, um, so who are these people? Who am I supposed to look at? So how will I know what God is saying through others? That's what I want to talk to you about. There's a couple passages before that. I want you to see that. You can take that home with you and read it. But it's very important for you not to listen to everyone. You know, we know this, right? We just don't say this in large groups because we want to be nice. But you understand, you can't listen to everyone. What would happen in this room if I said, hey, what do you think about strawberries, right? How many opinions would I have? I would have a ton of them. I would probably come out of here with recipes of how to make strawberry pie. I would come out of here with all kinds of stuff. I couldn't listen to everybody. I've got to listen to whom, though? Right? So how do I know who God is speaking through? Do you see what I'm saying? It's a hard question. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at this. Number one, I want you to listen to people who are already engaged in God's plan. All right, look at Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. This is not uh, in the original text, but it goes back to the story. I want you to see what happened to Elizabeth. Why out of all the people would Mary go to Elizabeth? Let's look at it. Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call his name John, who became John the He's not the first Baptist. It's actually, in the Greek, John the baptizer, right? That's what that's about? Okay. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's, what? Womb. Did you recognize that Elizabeth is not supposed to have children in the story? Is Mary supposed to have children? No, she's not supposed to. She's a teenager. We have a teenager and a grandma, and they're both pregnant. Any similarities there? Yes, the Lord's work. (laughs) We got to grow this church in some ways. Let's go, people. You know? No, I'm just teasing. When you are looking, trying to find someone to listen to, what you're doing is you're listening to the people who are already engaged in God's plan. It was really clear that Elizabeth was already in. There's no turning back. She can't avoid it. She can't hide it. It's going to happen. Can you hide a pregnancy? No, it's going to happen. Elizabeth is knee deep in God's purpose. And who does Mary go to? Mary goes to one who's already engaged in the story of God's redemptive work. Listen to those people. Listen to people who are involved in the purposes of God. You're going to have people sitting in the stands watching your life, and they're going to have all kinds of opinions for you. You can't listen to them. You got to keep doing what God has called you to do. Who do you listen to? You listen to the others that are on the field with you. The ones who are fulfilling God's purpose. The ones who are already engaged in. Okay, so number two. Here's another person. Spend time with those who understand your situation. Look at Luke verses, uh, uh, chapter one, verses 19. Actually, it's supposed to be 39 through 40. It says this. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country. Ladies, can I ask you a question? When you get pregnant, do you do anything in haste? I mean, honestly, you never know how you're going to feel. You might, in haste, run to the bathroom, right? Because you're not feeling well. But when you're pregnant, do you do anything in haste? Why would she go in haste? 
She's got to go to someone that she knows is in a current situation like hers. I just know I've got to be around Elizabeth. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. She was so excited to be with someone who was in the same odd situation as she was. And Elizabeth could understand. Elizabeth could relate, you think? Elizabeth going, man, I know. What's going on around this joint, man? Did we drink the same water or what? If it hadn't been for the angels, can you imagine what the story would have looked like? They would have been trying to figure out this whole thing. The angels were the ones who confirmed the story for them. Same story, same situation. People engaged with God. These are the people that you listen to. All right, lastly, number three, find confidence in those who do not need to be first. Find confidence in those who do not need to be first in your story of what God is doing in your story. Here's why. Can you imagine this story going any differently? I can. You have Elizabeth who has never had a child. I mean, out of all the women that should deserve a child, this is a woman who deserves one. She's never had a child. She has this amazing moment where her her husband, Zachariah, is actually picked out to be the priest for that day, which was just an enormous thing. Because you may never be picked out to serve before the people as a priest. She gets that news, and then while he's in there, he comes out, he's not able to talk because there's this amazing story about this angel telling her she's going to have a child. Now she's pregnant, and she could be like, man, this is it. And here comes this little teenager in my house, still in my what? glory. Who does she think she is? <laughs> right? What gives her the right? Right? You see how this could have gone? This could have gone a different direction. But Elizabeth understood her story so well that she was excited about God's story in other people's lives. You got to be careful about people who have not ever discovered their God's purpose in their life jumping into yours, trying to hijack yours. They have no idea what they're talking about. So you got to find confidence with people who love to be second. When I was in high school, I used to play basketball. It's one of the things that I did. And I learned as I played basketball, one of my favorite joys was not shooting. It was not a breakaway. It was not a layup. It was not all the dunks that I had. <laughs> I, have a, I have a two inch vertical, so there's no dunking happening on my end. So there was a time when I was skinny where I could jump, but I still had a two inch vertical, right? So I need to explain that. But what I loved most was passing the ball to see people score. I loved it. I would figure out how to pass the ball more than I needed to. And coach would be so mad. He's like, what are you doing? There's no one around. It's a wide open layup. Layup. I know, but coach, this guy was behind me. I was just laid off the glass and he could dunk it. And coach was like, put the ball in the hoop. You know, I just love seeing people score. Do you have those people in your life that love to see you score? Are you one of those people who like to see others score? I want this place, Church of the Valley, to be a place where we love to see one another score, where we build one another up, where we celebrate the excitement of what God is doing in people's lives all around us. How would that be? Wouldn't that be amazing? It would be amazing. And the unfortunate part is the reason it's not that way currently is because some of us haven't discovered the purpose God has for us. And I want you to discover God's purpose for you. He has a purpose for your life. His story is going to be played out with or without you, but he's inviting you into it. Out of all the places in the world that you could be this morning, you're here at Church of the Valley, you're living in Apple Valley where there's 83% of people who don't go to church. I can't imagine a better place to be, to celebrate the work of God. Can you? I mean, it, for lack of a better term, and this is probably something used in Texas, I probably shouldn't use it, but it's like shooting fish in a barrel. We 
don't have to chase other Christians down. You know how we used to do in church? Hey, come over to our church for a while. You know, hang out with us just to make our numbers better. You remember that? We don't have to do that. There's so many here that don't know God. And that's the purpose that every one of us has because God has given us this area, this community to love. Yes, we love one another. Yes, we come together and encourage one another. But when we go out, we've got an entire community to share the love of Christ with. Mary, I believe, found joy in her calling. She didn't find her calling. She knew her calling, but she found joy in her calling when she found the right person who confirmed her calling. Some of you have been called into God's purpose, and you've been working at it, but there's no joy to it. And it's, you feel like you're doing something wrong. You're not doing anything wrong. It's just you got a bunch of naysayers around you. Get rid of them. Find the right person to speak into your life. Find the right person to give you the confidence you need. Find the right person that, is God, that you're, God is working in already and understands your situation and spend time with them. I have a great opportunity called the Story Groups. A small group. If you're not in a small group, we'd love for you to be in one. That's where we find encouragement and strength. People that are in the story together, we're learning and talking in the same way. You don't have to know all the answers. Matter of fact, we come together just to talk. We want you to be a part of our small groups, to connect with people who want you to win. And I believe this room is filled with people who want you to win, who love you and want to see God's purpose in your life. When Mary found the right person, it's where we find the start of a song. And you know what the the meaning of that song is? It means victory. You see, her song that she found in the confidence of Elizabeth was one of victory. I've won. Has she won? She's pregnant. It's not a good situation. She was able to see over her situation and see to God's purpose and say, you know what? Not only have I won, but God has won. Amen? Amen. When you find the right person to confirm what God is doing in your life, your words will turn into song. Your song will turn into joy. And you'll be more confirmed about what God is doing in your life than ever before. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives and in our church. We thank you, God, how you're so faithful to love us and to take care of us and to invite us into the purpose that you have. Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us that you have prepared good works for us to accomplish, meaning that you, as a good, good and faithful father, you have prepared things for us to complete because you love to see your people score. So God, help us to see those moments. Help us to know those moments. So on your sermon outline, and if you got one of those communication cards, I want you to pull those two things out. We at Church of the Valley here would like for people to make next steps because we feel like sometimes it's so hard to get to the end of the journey in one service. that We feel like people just need small steps. And so I want to give you an opportunity to win today. I want to invite you to take one of four steps, okay? Maybe your step this morning with the Lord, as you've listened, as you've heard God's word, maybe your step today is, you know what? I'm surrendering to God's call on my life. Maybe you've been someone who has been fighting the purpose that you know God has placed in your life, and you're saying, you know what? I'm I'm tired of fighting it. Today, I'm surrendering to that. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't have a plan. All I know that it is in my heart right now, I'm surrendering to the purpose of God that he has for my life. Maybe that's you. So on that communication card, you turn it over and just put the number one somewhere on that. Maybe that's not your step. Maybe your step is number two. Maybe you're saying, Joel, you know what? I'm joining a small group because I need right people in my life. I don't have the right people in life, and I want some right people, so I want to join a small group. I want to make a small group, or I know the people I want in my small group. Maybe that's your step today. If that's your step today, write that number two on the back of your card, and then take it right over to the book table at the end of the service to get your book and to get your small group uh, book, and then let Karen know, and we can plug you in or create a small group for you as we journey through the story. 
Maybe that's not where you are. Maybe you're at number three and you say, I want God's joy. I'm not sure I've ever really known God. See, one of the truths about meeting God is that he delivers joy. This is why you have people breaking out in song in the scripture. It wasn't that the writer thought, you know, this will be a great place to put a song. So I'm just going to insert it into the story. These are real people who met a real God, and the response of that, the result of that, was pure joy. I wonder, do you have joy? If you don't, I know the Savior who wants you to have joy. He desires for you to have joy. Notice I'm not saying happiness. I'm saying joy. Joy is this peace inside no matter what else outside of you is happening. There is still this abundant peace you have inside. This is what the scripture talks about when you have a, a spring of, of joy just welling up in your soul. Joy and peace go hand in hand. If you feel like you're struggling with God, you probably are. And he will win. <laughs> no one's ever won a wrestling match against God. But the greatest way to find joy is to turn your life over to the Lord. Maybe that's what you need to do first before you find the purpose is just to say, you know what, Lord, I'm turning my life over. I have never said I love you. I've never said I wanted to follow you, but today I do. If that's your step, maybe that's your step number three. Maybe it's number four. Maybe you're a skeptic. Maybe you're, and we're, we welcome skeptics. We welcome people who don't know the Lord. We welcome people that have never been in church before. So maybe that's where you are. You're like, Joel, I've not heard this stuff before. And I just have more questions. So maybe your step is number four, where it says, I want to know more. And what we've set up for you today is right after the service, beginning right over here in this area, we're going to, as soon as the service is over, we're going to break down these chairs a little bit and we're going to set up tables right over here. And we're going to launch into a thing called Alpha. And at Alpha, we serve lunch. We have a video to show you, and you'll sit around the table and ask a question if you desire to ask a question. But it's our desire to, find, to create a place for people who have questions about who God is, what the church is, what's prayer about, what is this all about. And we'd love for you to stay. Maybe that's your step. You want to join us for Alpha. Maybe this is the first time you've heard of it and you don't even know what it is. You're welcome to stay and check it out for one session to see what you think. It's worth it, isn't it? If it's true that I'm talking about a God that is real and that is living and can offer you joy, isn't it worth it? Amen. And I would invite you to stay. We want you to stay. We've provided a place for you to stay. You belong here and we love you and we want you to know the, the Lord. We want you to know the joy that he offers to us. So real quick, what I'd like to do is I'd like for you now, let's, we can't ever do things just on our own. We always have to ask for the Holy Spirit's help to accomplish what we've set our mind to do. If you've written a step on your card, what you've actually done is you set your mind to try something. That can ever happen. It won't ever come to be unless the Holy Spirit helps you, all right? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to pray real quick right now to just ask the Lord to help you with the step that you've decided to make today. Let's pray. Father, I pray so much for these, your people. May the power of your Holy Spirit come upon them. May you establish their steps. Will you bring them to fruition? Would you accomplish the goals for which they have set their mind to? We learn in Scripture that really quickly the enemy comes in and, and steals away our joy. He steals away our attempts. He steals away our effort, our intentions. Life happens when we walk out this door. And so, God, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would seal this next step upon your people, that they would be able to accomplish what they have determined to do. Lord, we also pray for those among us who are not doing well, we pray for our friends, our, our covenant partners who have been, a, been at Church of the Valley for a long time, Bruce and Marsha, who lost their son, Tony, this past week. We pray, God, your peace and grace upon them. 
We know, God, that they're in the midst of moving to Alaska. They've sold their house. They're waiting for that to close. In the midst of all of that stress, Lord, they have lost their son. Marcia shared with me on the phone, it's not any parent's desire for their son to die, their child to die before the parent does. And so, Lord, we lift them up and we lift others up in this room today who've experienced that same thing. We pray for grace and peace to be upon their life. We pray for the band's family. We pray, God, that you would strengthen them, give them endurance in this moment. This time of trial that they're walking through, would you make a way for them to return to your kingdom, return to your church? Lord, give them safe passageway to get back to the safety of a church. The life fights against us and struggles against us when we want to serve you. So God, I pray that you would make their path straight and high so that they can walk on it. Lord, we pray for our brother Keith Anderson who uh, were here not long ago and they moved and, and now, Father, his health has led him into hospice. So God, we pray for Keith. We pray for healing. We pray for his family. We're so thankful that he is with his family now. But God, we pray for peace and comfort during this time. Lord, we pray for John Schaefer, Don's dad. We pray uh, for his hip, that you would heal it, God, as he's fallen and he's an older gentleman. And Lord, we all understand the obstacles that come along with that. And so God, I pray for grace and peace and, and mercy and strength and endurance. I pray for the wisdom of the doctors. I pray for the family to circle around, to have the right word at the right time. I pray for healing. Lord, whatever you would provide, we ask that you would provide that in their family to provide great peace. And Lord, I pray for my friend Gladys, Greg's mom, who uh, just discovered her neighbors, who so faithfully bring her paper to her, has COVID, has been diagnosed with COVID. Lord, I pray that you would comfort Gladys, help her. I pray that... Uh, her body would respond to you and that there would not be found in her this COVID virus. For her neighbors that so faithfully serve her, I pray that you'd heal them and protect them and keep them safe. God, I pray that you would help them to come out of this. For those of us who have friends who've died from COVID or who are concerned about COVID, who are maybe watching us right now on our broadcast because they're afraid to come, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, shalom to be upon them. We pray for their bodies to respond. We pray for their good health, that you would give them confidence, God, and that you would just heal our land of this terrible pandemic. And so, God, you're a good father, and you've taught us how to pray. And so now, Father, we, we turn back to you, and we say this prayer back to you, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.